Hello and welcome. This is the Succubus Scholar and today I wish to continue on from my previous video. To many, Lilith is simply the female version of Satan or, to those of a more anarchic bent, the epitome of female empowerment. She is so much more complex than this, however. This same cursory glance goes towards her origins also and makes the majority of the Texan videos I found when researching into this rarely going beyond the alphabet of Ben Sira, and, as a consequence, losing much of who and what she is. As such, this video will have three parts. The first tackles her much debated Sumerian origins. The second will explore the conflicting origin myths within Hebrew legend, and finally, I wish to put forth my own theory as to Lilith's origin, conjured in my time spent researching and meditating on her. But first, a disclaimer. An enormous portion of my references will come from the Zohar and Midrash texts. I, alas, cannot read Hebrew and must rely on second-hand sources. I have done my best to check the validity of these sources, but just in case, I will cite not just the passages, but where I attain them. So, without further ado, let us travel back to those ancient times of the Sumerian Empire. Gilgamesh struck the serpent who could not be charmed. The Anzi bird flew with his young to the mountains, and Lilith smashed her home and fled to the wild uninhabited places. Gilgamesh then loosened the root of the hulupi tree, and the sons of the city who accompanied him cut off the branches. Perhaps the most renowned evidence put forward as to Lilith's Sumerian origins is actually from an Akkadian translation of Tablet 12 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. In Kramer's translation, the goddess Inanna took a hulupi tree of which many speculate to be a willow, and sought to nurture it before cutting it down to make a throne and bed for herself. After fifteen years, Inanna could not approach the tree, however, for it became the abode of the serpent of its roots, the anzu bird in its branches, and Lilake, translated by Kramer to the dark maid Lilith in its trunk. After much weeping, Inanna eventually lists the aid of her brother, Gilgamesh who, interestingly enough, is supposedly the son of Lilu, which is the Sumerian version of an incubus, just as a side note. Gilgamesh takes down the serpent who could not be charmed. Seeing this, both Lilith and the anti bird flee to the wilderness, leaving the tree to its fate as furniture for Ishtar, and the mysterious Paku and Miku as a reward for Gilgamesh. I have come across articles that attempt to interpret this story by its many symbolisms as Inanna's maturing into womanhood, but I disagree. Lilith is linked to the wilderness frequently, and Inanna, who some equate to as Aphrodite, then Venus, now Babylon, is also often linked to civilization. To me, it is a tale of man versus nature. Remember that in those days, nature was not a place of scenery and serenity as we tend to think of it today, with cities seen as the rat race and the cattle pens of humanity. Back then, nature was the enemy, full of strange terrors, predators, and dangers that the city offered shelter from. And so I consider the cutting down of the Halupi tree as symbolism of man's taming of the wilderness, cutting it down, then fashioning it into devices of our own. But there could be even more to it than this. Picture, if you will, the Halupi tree as a symbol of the human body. The serpent is often used as a symbol of the kundalini force, coiled at the base of our spine, or in this case, the roots. The anzu bird tends to be depicted as an owl, a symbol of insight or wisdom, taking its nest in the branches, or perhaps in this case, our skulls. And Lilith, I confess I'm a little less certain on, but I believe it might represent our mystical or maternal instincts, located in the trunk that is our body. Perhaps this legend has a deeper meaning. When the gods came, they cut off our kundalini force and our other senses were denied us. Perhaps in order to tame us? A stretch perhaps, but I'll consider it worthy of your consideration. It must be noted that Kramer's translation of Ki Sikul Lilake as the Dark Maid Lilith is a point of contention among scholars. Some instead translating it as some form of spirit or owl residing in the tree. This translation would go on to be used to identify the Bernie relief as Lilith, though I'm inclined to agree with the majority that this is unlikely, 
it being more likely Eshkigal, goddess of the underworld. Now, this next origin myth put forward was a source of much frustration for me. Frequently I came across the origin myth that Lilith actually began as a servant to the goddess Inanna, the hand of Inanna if you will, sent out into the wilderness by the goddess to work her designs. This appeared in various articles which would give either no citation to back this or the source they did give offered no evidence as to where this actually came from. I was ready to dismiss it as pagan fancy when I was finally led to the Babylonian liturgies by Stephen Langdon within which is the translation of Incantation in the House of Light against the Harlot of Inini. The sacred maid stands in the street. The maid Harlot of Inini stands on the wall. Fatted cow, fatted cow is she, fatted cow of Anina is she. Maiden who in the house of the mighty prince of Eridu dwells. Like the verdant garden bearing seemliness is she. Her bed like is made in the holy city. Shepherdess of the plain, protection of is she. The limbs of a man she looked upon, limbs of one beloved are they. The hand of a man she looked upon, hand of one beloved is it. The foot of a man she looked upon, the foot of one beloved is it at the holy threshold of Lazuli. Her beloved lay in repose, her beloved was disposed, her beloved from above like the strong man like a deluge she overwhelmed. Marduk beheld it, to his father ear, into the house of he entered and wailed. O oh, my father, the sacred maid stood in the street. Twice he spoke thus. What he has said I know not, how I shall restore him I know not. Ea answered his son, Marduk, O oh, my son, what know I, what shall I add to thee? O oh, Marduk, what know I, what shall I add to thee? Whatsoever I know, thou also knowest. Fat of the sacred steer, milk of the cow. Fat of a steer, fat of a white steer, take. With fat his limbs anoint. The breast of the maiden, turn away. Maid, who opened the door, mayst thou disperse. The son of his god, who wept, may sigh no more. Behind me, the wandering demon may one cause to perish. Curse! Incantation of the House of Light. In these fragments is given the means to keep the hand of Inanna from enticing men. The hand of Inanna being linked by the translator to the Ardat Lili and Lilitu, who are in turn linked to Lilith. This does bear similarities with some of the later bands, divorces or spells used to free men of the pursuit of Lilith and her king with this suggesting that they were, at least once, servants of Inanna, perhaps originating as the new gigs, the hall priestesses who once served in Inanna's temples, then sent into the streets and wild to work like car kids or streetwalkers. Speaking of the Ardat Lili and Lilitul, it is from the ancient texts of Mesopotamia that we find the earliest known forms of the Incubi and Succubi, known as, indeed, the Erdu lily for the males and the female Ardat lily, which would later become referred to as the Lilu for the males and Lilitu for the females. From these terms alone, it is not hard to assume the connection to Lilith and her kin, but this is further cemented by the text warning how these beings disturb people in their beds or come within erotic dreams. Further clarifying these earlier succubi incubi that we know today. It is also said that the amulets that were uncovered at Arsenal and Tash also indicate that Lilith may have been known at these earlier times. But alas, much like the Epic of Gilgamesh, the translation of this is very much disputed. As one delves into these Sumerian or Mesopotamian links, one gets a sense of a class of minor demons, amongst of which there was one who would rise in the ranks to become the renowned queen we know today. It is also frustrating as we simply do not know the truth of this. The hints are there, but there is no solid or irrefutable evidence which proves the existence of Lilith and her children in this age. This identity and motives would not be further clarified until the rise of rabbinic literature. And it is here we would see more with regards to where she came from. I already covered the most famous of Jewish literature concerning Lilith's origins, the satirical alphabet of Ben Sirah. Here I want to cover those that have less renown, but are nonetheless worthy of note. I would start with the Bereshit 34b, as I have taken from Scholem's translation via the Sapphire.org website. 
describing Adam and Lilith starting as a conjoined entity. God then cut the female from him and decked her as a bride and led her to him. As it is written, and he took one of his sides and closed up the place with flesh. Genesis 2.21 In the ancient books I've seen it said that here the word one means one woman, that is, the original Lilith, who lay with him and from him conceived. But up to that time she was no help to him. As it is said, but for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. Genesis 2.20 Adam then was the very last, for it was right that he should find the world complete when he made his appearance. It is a shame the Rabbi Simeon who is speaking here does not mention the source of these ancient books he supposedly saw this in. Nor does he go into detail as to why Lilith was of no help to Adam, seemingly assuming that the student is already familiar as to why. A commentary by Rabbi Reuben Hoshka Kohen in his Yalkut Rabini gives a rather casually misogynistic explanation as to why a woman made in the same manner as Adam would be a failure. This translation I have taken from The Case for Lilith by Mark Briggs. In the beginning, the Holy One, blessed be he, created Eve, i.e. the first Eve, who is known as Lilith. And she was not flesh, but the scum of the earth, and its impure sediments. And she was a harmful spirit. And the Holy One, blessed be he, took her away from Adam and gave him another in her stead. Just as Eve, and thus woman, is made the scapegoat for mankind's fall, so Reuben makes Lilith to blame for her flawed design, rather than thinking to question the creator who made her in that manner. Gods forbid, quite literally, that the creator would be capable of making an imperfect being, being so perfect himself. Next, let's take a look at the passage from the Zohar 319. Come and see! There is a female, a spirit of all spirits, and her name is Lilith, and she was at first with Adam. And in the hour when Adam was created and his body became completed, a thousand spirits from the left, evil side, clung to that body until the Holy One, blessed be he, shouted at them and drove them away. Adam was lying, a body without a spirit, and his appearance was green, and all those spirits surrounded him. In that hour a cloud descended and pushed away all those spirits, and when Adam stood up, his female was attached to his side. And that Holy Spirit which was in him spread out to this side and that side and grew here and there and thus became complete. Thereafter the Holy One, blessed be he, sawed Adam in two and made the female. And he brought her to Adam in her perfection like a bride to the canopy. When Lilith saw this, she fled. And she is in the cities of the sea and she is still trying to harm the sons of the world. This passage suggests that Lilith was never a human, but a spirit of spirits, clearly denoting her sovereignty amongst them, and one of her thousand who sought to possess or copulate with Adam. When Adam takes on a greenish hue, it's clear that this companionship with spirits is not good for his health, so the creator scares them away. And much like a scientist growing a creature from DNA samples, he grows Eve from Adam's side before sawing them apart. When Lilith sees how inadequate she is in comparison to Eve, she flees. This feeling of inadequacy compared to Eve continues in the Zohar 119b. After the primeval light was hidden, a husk was created for the brain, and that husk spread out and brought forth another husk, which was Lilith. And when she emerged, she went up and went down towards the little faces, and wanted to attach herself to them and be shaped after them, and did not want to depart from them. But the Holy One, blessed be he, removed her from there and placed her down below, when he created Adam in order to perfect this world, as soon as Elif saw Eve affixed to the side of Adam, and saw in them the beauty of the above, and saw their perfect image, she flew off from there and wanted as before to attach herself to the little faces. But the guardians of the gates of above did not let her. The Holy One, blessed be he, rebuked her and cast her into the depths of the sea, and she remained dwelling there until Adam and his wife sinned. Now, the little faces mentioned here are often interpreted as the cherubim, suggesting that they've had a preference for the angels. The creator disproved of this and sent her down to Adam's plane of existence. Seeing Eve's perfection, however, she sought to flee back to the cherubim, only to be imprisoned in the sea as a punishment. More than this, however, it reveals that Lilith was created as an entity of the husk, which was made to conceal the light. 
Lilith is often connected to the term Leil, meaning night, and that connection is displayed here as being born from this veil. As she proclaimed in Ben Sira's text, she seems to have been made of the shadows by design. Further evidence when she is freed from the seas to act as a punisher to children whose parents have sinned later in this same text. Yet another Kabbalistic reference to Lilith's emergence is found in Jacob's journey in the Zohar Sitri Torah 1147b to 148b, as taken from Daniel Matt's Zohar, the Book of Enlightenment. The secret of secrets. Out of the scorching noon of Isaac, out of the dregs of wine, a fungus emerged, a cluster, male and female together, red as a rose, expanding in many directions and paths. The male is called Samael. His female is always included within him. Just as it is on the side of holiness, so it is on the other side. Male and female embracing one another. The female of Samael is called Serpent, woman of whoredom, end of all flesh, end of days. Two evil spirits join together. The spirit of the male is subtle. The spirit of the female is diffused in many ways and paths, but joined to the spirit of the male. In Pate's excellent Hebrew goddess work, the scorching noon of Isaac is identified as the Sephiroth Kabura, sphere of judgment. As before, Lilith, along with her male counterpart Samael, is formed from the husk of this sphere the dregs of wine, the shadow to the light. A similar yin-yang type theory is found in Hakohan's Treatise on the Left Emanation, showing Samael and Lilith emerging as opposites of Adam and Eve. In answer to your question concerning Lilith, I shall explain to you the essence of the matter. Concerning this point, there is a received tradition from the ancient sages who made use of the secret knowledge of the lesser palaces which is the manipulation of demons and the ladder by which one ascends to prophetic levels. In this tradition, it is made clear that Samael and Lilith were born as one, similar to the form of Adam and Eve who were also born as one, reflecting what is above. This is the account of Lilith, which was received by the sages in the secret knowledge of the palaces. The matron Lilith is the mate of Samael. Both of them were born at the same hour in the image of Adam and Eve, intertwined in each other. I am a particular fan of Hakkahan's treaty, not just for the origin of Lilith it provides, but also for the enormous amount of law it provides. It reveals that in working with these entities from the lesser palaces, or likely Clipper as it's better known, the sages once gained prophetic powers, amongst other things. More than that, earlier in the treaty it states all of them resided at the throne of glory, but Lilith brought about a calamity by means of Gamaliel and the snake Nahashiel. Other than being called Sin, it's not described what the Calamity is, only that Zephanit, a title for Lilith as the Northern One, brought it about to destroy the Celestial Children, and that snakes have increased in the world ever since. I believe the Celestial Children are the offspring of Adam and Eve, and the snakes those of Samael and Lilith. There must have been competition between the two peoples that led to the Calamity, instigated by Lilith that her children may emerge dominant. For those who are fascinated by the Clipper, I highly recommend reading this one. Now, there are many, many, many Hebrew texts referencing Lilith that I could continue with, but I shall save some of these for another video and stop here. What we can conclude from this is Lilith is regarded as the Yang to the Ying that is Eve, and in fact may never have been the first woman at all, but always a different entity entirely. In short, there are many conflicting myths claiming to know Lilith's true origins. I suggest you read them all, or as many as you can, and stick by the one that feels right to you. Which leads me to my own theory as to Lilith's origins, if you'll permit me the indulgence. Before I continue, like most of the Sumerian links, I have no solid evidence for this, only supposition gained from my own studies and musings. For this, we must return back to the very ancient age once more, back to Mesopotamia in fact, and the clay tablets depicting the beginning of things, known as the Enuma Elish. I do not wish to go into vast detail, as Tiamat deserves a video of her own. To put it in a grotesquely simplified manner, Apsu and Tiamat bring forth the first gods, and from the first gods, more gods. 
Apsu grew to dislike them and plotted their demise, only to be slain by Ia, who would go on to sire a son named Marduk. Tiamat was apparently rather unflustered by the death of her husband, and instead would marry her own son, Kingu. It was only until she was pressured by her allies that she sired eleven generals with her son and declared war. In the great battle that ensues, Marduk slays Tiamat, and Kingu is taken captive. Tiamat's body is used to craft the heaven and the earth, and Kingu is slain to create the first mortals to serve the new pantheon. Thus, the shard of a vanquished god dwells within all of us. How does this relate to Lilith, you ask? I believe there are one of two ways. Many of the chronic creatures of Tiamat's army would either flee or agree to serve the new rulers. One of the eleven generals sired from Kingu was Kalulu, Fishman, or Kaliotu, Fishwoman. Aside from the linguistical similarity to Lilith, or Lilitu, Lilith is often linked to the sea and its depths, her consort sometimes being identified as Leviathan. She is often also said to dwell in the cities of the sea, as such it could be that she is either Kaliltu or a descendant who has since risen up in the ranks. Another possibility continues on in the line of the story of Ben Sira. If you research Sumerian mythology long enough, it becomes apparent that the later myths and legends tend to borrow from these, the delusion of Noah's Ark being a prime example of this. If one identifies the creator god as Marduk, who created humanity via Kingu's essence, perhaps he used Kingu's essence to create the males, or Adam, and a part of Tiamat to create the women, or woman, Lilith. Tiamat was a primordial goddess, however, a sovereign, and this stateliness likely caused her to rail against subservience and flee to those defeated rebels near the sea. Seeing Adam was still loyal and demure, however, Marduk would create a replacement using the essence of Kingu still, which would become Eve, accepting Tiamat's essence as simply too unruly. This one appeals to me as it helps with Lilith's links to serpents and dragons, as well as why she finds preferable the company of demons who once served the entity she was made from. It also explains her motive of seeing her children arise dominant over the creations of Marduk. It may also explain why Lilith acts as both a lover and mother to those in the occult who gain her favour and guidance. Yuni Murali suggests that a part of Kingu resides in all of us. If a shard of Tiamat's spirit lies within Lilith, Tiamat having married her son, it is only natural that echoes of those emotions would arise in both parties. This is, of course, my own theory, and you are well within your rights to disregard it. I suggest, if you are daring enough, calling upon Lilith herself and seeing if she will be willing to divulge her origins upon you. But for now, I will draw this to a close. Thank you for listening, and I hope this step beyond the commonly accepted origin of Lilith has given you something to dwell on. If you have any theories of your own, or if you've noticed anything that you would like to point out to me, please do let me know. But for now, I bid thee adieu, and may Lilith bring you pleasant dreams. <laughs>